Good morning, and thank you for watching. Look forward to have some, some things to share with you today. We're going to enjoy some worship together, as we always do uh, in, in these recordings uh, that are taking the place of our public Sunday gatherings, uh, and I so miss being with all of you. But uh, this is the best we can do right now, so we're just, uh, I'm thankful that we have this opportunity, and I just look forward to uh, that time when we can be together again. Just a couple of real quick things I want to share with you, just a couple of announcements. I appreciate everyone in the church that's been sending in their greetings. Uh, and uh, as I send those out and everybody sees them, people love them. And it just means so much to be able to see folks in the church and, and just to get those greetings and those uh, uh, kind of uh, long distance hugs, as it were, the best we can do right now. So what I've been doing now is, you know, some that I haven't got, I've been out doing drive-bys. I've been out, uh, I've been giving people a call and, and stopping by their house and just asking them to step out on the porch if they would for a second and just taking a short video of them. So I just want to get as many of the folks in the church a chance to just say hi and, and greet their uh, family in Christ. So again, I, I just encourage you in that. Uh, also, just want to mention we're still working on the uh, new sanctuary, and so if you're interested, you can respond to uh, us by email, or uh, if you know how to reach Rick Huntington, he's scheduling folks, so we're uh, abiding by all the restrictions and the separations and such, but you know we're scheduling things through the week and trying to get things done there, and um, uh, we're making great progress. I hope to maybe do another uh, walkthrough uh, in the not-too-distant future and show you the progress that we're making as I did a video walkthrough a couple of weeks ago. And lastly, again, I just thank you for those that have been faithful in their giving. Uh, we've actually been maintaining about 90% or so of our operating budget in these weeks that we've been off, and I've been very blessed and very thankful uh, for that. And one specific thing, I mentioned this in an email I sent out to the church this week, is that we're trying to purchase interior doors for the, for the building, for the new building, and they cost about $10,000 uh, because a couple of them, uh, the larger ones, are... The double doors are our fire, our fire doors, and so they're very costly. But um, so I'm just encouraging folks, you know, thank you for those that have given online, for those that still send checks in the mail. It is such a blessing that you haven't uh, uh, forgotten about us, and uh, certainly we haven't, we haven't forgotten about you. We're praying and uh, just, again, looking forward to being back together as a body of Christ. But I'm going to open in prayer and then turn it over to Dee Huntington, who's going to share worship with us, uh, some worship songs with us at this time. Father, I thank you. Uh, for this time to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ and others who might tune in and listen to this. And I pray, God, that everything that we uh, offer to you to this day would be pleasing and honoring to you and that you would, even through the means of this recording, God, that you would move by your spirit in the hearts of every person. And we thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We put our trust in you. And now as we lift our hearts and voices to you in worship, I pray you'd receive our worship and it would bring, again, honor to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's worship together. Nothing can separate even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have your mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never I'm not alone here in these open seas. 
your love never fails Chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails And you stay the same through the ages
Some of you have heard my testimony of how I came to a relationship with Jesus Christ. There was a man that I worked with by the name of Melvin Simmons, and he shared, he was the first one to really share with me what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus and why that was important, why we needed to have a relationship with Jesus, to be restored uh, to God because of our sin. And, and so Mel shared that with me. He was a young Christian, but uh, he had come to faith in Christ, and he shared that with me. And, you know, over the course of those weeks and months at work when we talked and sometimes we'd get together for lunch or even after work and uh, we talk about life, we talk about faith and, and I'd ask him a lot of questions. So in the course of those conversations, all kinds of different things would come up. And I don't remember specifically the context of the conversation, but we were talking about something and I think Mel was just talking about God meeting our needs and, you know, God being faithful and, and uh, taking care of us and such, you know, and all this was kind of new to me, obviously. This was even before I had made a commitment and before I had surrendered my life to Christ. But he shared a verse with me, and that's the verse that I want to use as a text uh, today as I share this message with you, and it's from Psalm 37. And I'm going to read Psalm 37, verses 23 through 25. And it goes like this. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. That's Psalm 37, verse 23 through 25. So I just want to walk through this and mention a couple of things. The first thing that it says is that God orders the steps of a good man or woman. And, and by good, it's not talking about our own goodness or, you know, things that we've done. It's talking about being in right relationship with God. That's the only goodness that we have by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But God orders our steps. And then it says that God delights in our way. And I think sometimes that's hard for us to imagine, you know, to think about God actually smiling down on us and being delighted by the way that we walk. And obviously it implies that we're trying to walk in a way that's obedient uh, to God and such, but God can delight in our ways. And then the psalmist, David said, he said, even when we fall and we will all stumble at one time or another, and probably many times in the course of our life, it says the Lord is holding our hand and he will help us get back on our feet. So even when we fall, we shall not be utterly cast down. 
David said in that psalm. And then he comes to verse 25, and this was the verse that my friend Mel shared with me. And I remember it, you know, we're talking 43 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. As we were having this conversation one day, and he said to me, uh, he, he quoted this verse, and this is David speaking. He said, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. And that is an amazing promise from the word of God. And it has special significance, I think, for us in this time that we're living in right now. Throughout David's long life, as he reflected on all the things he had seen, all the things that he had experienced through his life, and he had a very eventful life, if you know the scriptures, he concluded that he had never seen a righteous person forsaken by the Lord. Let that sink in. He had never seen a righteous person forsaken by the Lord. Do you know why David never saw a righteous person forsaken by the Lord? It's because it doesn't happen. It never, never happens. And again, let that sink in. God does not forsake his people. God does not forsake his children. You know, as important as it is to know what the word of God says, it's also important to realize as we look at this verse in Psalm 37, 25, what the word of God does not say. It does not say, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous go through hard times. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, I have not seen the righteous face storms in his or her life. It doesn't say, I have not seen the righteous suffer in their lives. David said, and of course it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. That's the key. We do go through storms. We do go through difficult things in our lives. But David said, and we can hold that promise fast in our hearts today, that the righteous are never forsaken by God. So I think most of us understand what the word righteous means. And, and uh, you know, I think we have a basic understanding of it. But sometimes it helps when you're studying the scriptures to just go through and take a look at what the word means in the original language. So I went back and I was looking, and the word forsaken there actually comes from a root word that means to loosen. And the implication here is like loosening your grip. It's saying, so what this verse is saying is that God never loosens his grip on his children. Think about that. You know, as I was considering that, that God doesn't lose his grip. I was thinking about the story in the Gospels, one of probably the most well-known stories, uh, one of them in the Gospels, and that's Peter walking on the water. You know, Jesus is walking on the water, and the disciples are in the boat, and they're fearful because of the storm, and, and Peter sees Jesus out there, and he says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out. And of course, Jesus says, come out. And, and we all know the story, many of us know the story. Peter got out, and he starts walking on the water. But as he's walking and the storm is raging around him, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. And just this past Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, that night, Easter Sunday night, Lori and I were watching, uh, some of you are familiar with Sights and Sounds Theater out of Pennsylvania that does these live productions of uh, stories of the Bible. And, and they were showing uh, on television, actually on TBN, they were showing Jesus, the, the live production of that. And they showed that story of Peter walking on the water. And the way they showed it, you know, as Peter got his eyes off of Jesus, he actually like sunk under the water. He was totally under the water. The scripture doesn't really make it clear how far he sunk, but in this uh, production, it shows him and he's actually underwater. And this strong arm of Jesus reaches down and grabs hold of Peter, grabs hold of him by his arm and pulls him back up to the surface. And you know, thank God, I have never been in a place in my life where I've been in a drowning situation. Most of us haven't been. Again, thank the Lord that we haven't been. But I can only imagine what it must have felt like for Peter to think, as he's out there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, to think, I'm drowning. And as he's going underwater and he's under the surface, to have this strong arm reach down and grab a hold of him. And I'm thinking what I would feel like in a situation like that. What a comfort, what a relief, 
What a reassurance to know that that strong hand has got a hold of me and he's not going to let me go. And God is saying to us through the scripture in Psalm 37, and again, just to kind of tie that together with the story of Peter, when he began to sing, God's saying, I got you. I have got you. So I was also thinking about this because David said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. And I was thinking about Jesus when he hung on the cross. There were seven sayings of Jesus that he spoke as he hung on the cross. And one of them is this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as I thought about that, and I thought about it in the context of what I'm sharing with you today, I realized this, Jesus, when he hung on the cross and took our sins upon himself, he was forsaken so that we didn't have to be forsaken. What an awesome truth that is. Now this promise, this promise from Psalm 37, it's to the righteous. And I think you probably understand this, but I'm just going to make this point and, and clarify. Our righteousness is not something that we produce in ourselves. It's not something that comes by virtue of our own actions or our own goodness. I think we all know that. This righteousness that we have is righteousness that has been given to us by God by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. I was thinking also of something that the Apostle Paul said as he was talking about his life and some of the struggles that he went through and some of the suffering that he endured. Again, that verse in, in Psalm 37 doesn't say that the righteous never suffer or never go through hard times or never go through storms. And so Paul is talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and he's talking about some of what he's been through for the gospel. And he says this, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. It's interesting, this passage in 2 Corinthians 4, it has both comforting words and hard words because Paul's talking about some pretty intense things. He mentions four different scenarios. The first, he says, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. You know, to be hard pressed on every side, that's something that's pretty intense. But he said, I'm not crushed. There's a difference. And then the second thing Paul says, he says, I've been perplexed. I'm perplexed at times in my life. There's times when I don't know what to do. And there's sometimes maybe even where he felt doubts in his heart and maybe not doubts about Jesus, but just doubts about what was happening around him and such. So he was perplexed. He, there was times that he didn't know what to do. But then he says, but I'm not in despair. I am not a person with no hope. I am not destitute. I am not utterly at a loss, which is what all that means when he says that uh, he's not in despair. And then the third thing, he says, I'm persecuted, which means that to be pursued in a hostile manner. He said, I've been through that. I've been persecuted, but here's this word again, but not forsaken. He's saying, I haven't been abandoned by God. I haven't been forgotten. I haven't been deserted by God. I'm not forsaken by God. And then finally, he says, I've been struck down, which means to be violently thrown to the ground. He says, I've been struck down, but I haven't been destroyed. And so, you know, he's saying, somebody can throw you to the ground. They can try to bring harm into your life and they may hurt you in some way or another, but they cannot destroy you. These are the promises of God. Again, David, I was young, now I'm old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. God is not loosening his grip on you or on me. So that's the first part of Psalm 37, 25, that the righteous are not forsaken. The second part, David says, he says, nor his descendants begging bread. Think about that. And I'm reminded of what Paul said in Philippians 4, 19. He said, and my God will supply your need according to his riches in glory. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself to Abraham as the Lord who provides. The Lord who provides. I think we understand this, but it's an important point that I want to make as I begin to kind of wrap this up here. 
today. We have a part to play in all of this. We have a responsibility when it comes to this. You know, I'm, I'm sharing with you what I think are some wonderful promises and some wonderful assurances from the Word of God. But you've got to understand that we have a responsibility and we have a role to play. You know, and some people might bristle at this a little bit, but you know, the promises in Scripture, many are conditional. Now, I'm not talking anything about God's faithfulness. God is eternally faithful. But there are many if-then kind of equations in the Bible. If you do this, God said, then he'll do, th then he'll do that. You know, if you do this, he'll do that. God is always faithful. He will always do his part. But we have a responsibility as well. And it would be wrong of me, and it would, it would be off balance for me to not make this point that these promises have a condition. They, they are considering the fact that we have a part to play. As I said, God will always do his part. We can trust him. We never have to doubt that. But we have a part to play. I'm not saying that we can add anything to what God has already done for us or what he will do for us in the future. But we do have to align ourselves in our lives in a way that allows us to be recipients of these, of these gracious promises of God, some of which I'm talking to you about today. I hope that's obvious, that we as God's children, we need to live our lives in a way that honors him. Right? If we're going to fully be able to embrace and be recipients of these promises, we need to be endeavoring to live a life that brings honor to him. I'm not suggesting perfection. None of us will live that out. I'm not suggesting for one second that we can add anything to our salvation or that it's works-based or anything like that. I'm just simply saying we have a role to play. You, know, you think about some of these scriptures. Give and it shall be given to you. There's a responsibility. If you want God to give to you, you have to be a giver. You have to have that kind of nature in you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, then you will find. Knock, then the door will be opened to you. Again, we have a responsibility in these things. Even in the Old Testament, where God provided manna in the wilderness to the children of Israel, there was conditions to it. I mean, they, there were certain things they had to do to go out and to obtain that manna. And, you know, on the Sabbath they weren't to go out, so the day before they were to collect twice as much and, and such. There were certain things that were required of them, even though this was a miraculous provision by God and he had done it all, they still had to do something. So that, I guess I'll just close with this thought, that we are in a partnership with God. He's by all means the senior partner. Aren't you glad about that? But we've got a responsibility. There's wonderful promises, but we've got things that we need to do in our lives. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6.1, it says that we are workers together with him. One translation says that we are co-laborers with him. Another says that we are God's partners. How cool is that? Again, that's the scripture. We're God's partners. We're partners with him. And he has done so much for us. He has promised to never leave us. He has promised to never forsake us. The righteous are never forsaken. He's got a firm grip on our lives and he is not letting go. Yes, we've got our part to do, but we know that God is faithful and he will always do his part. So just remember that, especially in these perilous times that we're living in right now, that the righteous are never forsaken, nor is their seed out begging bread. God is faithful. And I'll just close with this. Again, just encouraging you, just like I said in the beginning, when my friend that I worked with, my coworker, Mel, way back in those 40, what, 43 years ago, you know, when he was talking to me about what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I had never heard anything about that before. You know, I'd gone to church, but I didn't know about having a relationship with Jesus. And he shared that with me. And it's changed my life. And I know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants to change every person's life who will come to him by faith in what Jesus did on the cross. We are sinners, separated uh, from God by our sin. And through his death, when he shed his blood on the cross, and then by us receiving that by faith, turning away from our sins, 
we can have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that it is sure. It is settled in heaven. God, what you have said, you said not one bit of it would, would uh, not come to pass, that everything you've written will come to pass. So I just thank you for your, again, for your faithfulness. I thank you that we are not forsaken, that you have a, a tight grip on each one of us. And I thank you that you are still receiving sons and daughters to yourself who come to you through faith in Jesus. And I pray for anyone that's hearing my voice today that hasn't made that commitment, that they would say yes to Jesus and receive you into their lives so that they too could know these powerful promises of God and know what it means to have you as that friend that sits closer than a brother. I thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.